And so if you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 6, be in Ephesians 6. And while you're turning there, I'll, I'll begin. Uh, what I'm preaching about today, as, you, as I mentioned, is donning the whole armor of God, as described by Paul the Apostle in his closing remarks to believers in Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. And recognizing the fact that as followers and soldiers of Jesus Christ, we live in a, we're living in a paradigm in which we are constantly waging a spiritual battle in heavenly places against both the devil and the flesh, and that our conflict is not a physical one with flesh and blood, but rather a profound confrontation against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, is how the Apostle Paul terms it. In other words, our true adversaries are not of this world, but are the devil and his fallen angels who rule behind the scenes, who operate in the shadows and manipulate world events as the unseen forces exerting control and authority over the world's nations. You literally have powers and principalities that are controlling and manipulating world governments, policies, culture, society behind the scenes. And that is the true enemy. There is a spiritual dimension in a spiritual realm. It's not only what we see here, but there are actual angels and demons. And a lot of times this topic gets approached from a somewhat of a charismatic standpoint, where it's just all about, you know, deliverance, we're going to cast out demons, we're going to do all this stuff. But first of all, believers don't get indwelt by demons, we get indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Yet believers can be oppressed by demons. They can attack Christians from the outside, from the, you know, the external forces that are attacking us. And we are the target of the devil and his fallen angels. And so we need to be aware of the spiritual realm and of the spiritual warfare raging all around us. And so the Apostle Paul's words elsewhere in 2 Corinthians 10 three through five resonate deeply with this reality. He says in verse three of 2 Corinthians 10, he says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Remember that word strongholds. These are habits that we form that are negative and we need to overcome those strongholds or those habits through discipline, through consecration, through the study of God's word. And so the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So every thought, you know, elsewhere Paul says to renew your mind daily. And so we can renew our minds through the study of scripture, through prayer, and bring every thought captive, every thought captive to the word of God. That's how we should aim to live our lives every day when we wake up. There's a battle raging in the mind. And so that's where the real battle is. And we need to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And so this passage underscores the essence of spiritual warfare, you know, in which the battle begins and is fought in the mind through the spirit. And, and often the emotions are the target of this battle. And so our warfare is not one of physical combat, but a spiritual campaign which demands vigilance, biblical wisdom, and unwavering readiness to preach the gospel and to live godly lives. And so today I'd like to go over each of the six pieces of the whole armor of God. There are six different components to the armor of God so that we can understand and learn how to apply and deploy each of these critical defensive and offensive weapons in order to be effective disciples and soldiers of Jesus Christ. And the six pieces of the whole armor of God include the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. But before we begin, let's dive into the historical background and context of the armor of God as described in Ephesians 6. So at the time of this writing, time of writing this epistle to the Ephesians, along with Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon, Paul the Apostle was imprisoned in Rome. 
Okay, this was Paul's first imprisonment around AD 60 to 62. And Paul was likely under house arrest. And though he was confined and guarded by Roman guards and Roman soldiers, he had some limited freedom to preach and to teach and to write these letters. And so he wrote a lot of the letters like Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon while he was jailed that first time in Rome. And Paul's imprisonment was a consequence of preaching the gospel in Jerusalem where he was arrested and sent to Rome for trial as a dual Roman citizen. Now the broader context for his letter to the Ephesians was in light of early Christians who faced spiritual and doctrinal challenges from both within, from the Jews, from the unbelieving Jews. Of course, the apostles themselves were Jews, right? Jesus himself was the son of David, and they believed, however, the gospel, yet they had attacks from within, from unbelieving Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes, and without from the Romans and the Greeks and from pagan society, such as the imperial cult of Rome that we've been talking about in our Book of Revelation series. And so the early Christians were learning how to navigate their faith in a hostile world whose values were in severe opposition to the Christian faith. And so in this way, this in many ways applies to us today, right? This is something that we can learn from today as the culture of this world becomes increasingly hostile to the ethics and morality and to the ways of God and the Bible. And so Paul's objective was to instruct early Christians on how to live godly and glorify God, preach the gospel in a hostile environment that had very different moral and ethical standards than what Christ requires of his saints and what the Bible demands of his church. And so it was in this context that the Apostle Paul, drawing on the metaphor of the armor and weaponry of Roman guards who held him captive. Remember, they were the guards that had imprisoned him. He was using this, the, the Roman armor, the full suite of armor, the full suit of armor to strengthen and to encourage marginalized believers to stay the course and to fight the good fight. And so Paul often used the metaphor and imagery of war and warriors and soldiers and battle to underscore biblical truth in a way that was relatable to his audience. For example, in 2 Timothy 2, 3 through 4, Paul says to his protege and his disciple Timothy, his his son in the faith, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And so the soldier is concerned with war. He's concerned with the task that he's been given. And in Christ, we are soldiers for Christ. We're soldiers in the army of God fighting a spiritual battle against the devil and against the world and against the flesh. In 1 Timothy 1.18, Paul says to Timothy, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. So Paul very much saw the Christian life as a battle and a war to be waged. You know, Paul viewed the Christian life as a lifelong war to be waged. He didn't view the gospel and the Christian life as a luxury cruise ship, but as a battleship. And so Christians need to wake up to the reality that we are immersed in a spiritual battle of unparalleled proportions, and it's a battle between good and evil. You know, that should be our paradigm in our reality. We're not just here to hang out and have a good time, although, you know, enjoy, you can enjoy the blessings God has given you, but we are here ultimately to wage a war against Satan and the devil and to preach the gospel. We've been given the blessing of being saved and being given eternal life in heaven, yet the world is perishing right? And they're on their way to hell. And so we need to be soldiers in a battle. And there's a a battle going on for the mind, for the emotions, and for the culture, right? And all these things stand in opposition to Christ and his word. And so every aspect of of the world around us, the prevailing trends, dominant philosophies, widespread arguments, and the overall trajectory of societal values stand in contrast to the principles and values of the kingdom of God. And so in 2 Timothy 4, uh, 7 through 8, as Paul is approaching his impending death 
and execution by Rome later on, you know, during his next imprisonment. Uh, he does get out, you know, and gets imprisoned again. Uh, but towards the end of his life, Paul doesn't say that he's lived a good life. He doesn't say, I've enjoyed my life, I've been prosperous, I've lived a good life. He says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. And so Paul has fought a good fight. Again, it's battle language, right? It's a war that's going on in the spiritual realm. And that's what the gospel, the preaching of the gospel, living as a Christian is. It's a, it's a spiritual battle. And so I want to have the same privilege to be able to say with the Apostle Paul at the end of my life, on my deathbed, that I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. That is the number one goal that we should aspire to, to be able with a clear and good conscience to honestly say that we fought for the Lord, we stood for the Christian values with biblical principles, and we preached the gospel, we kept the faith, we were faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the goal of life, right? It's to fight a good fight. And so the imagery of the you know, Roman armor uh, would have been familiar and relatable to the Ephesians, making Paul's message that much more impactful and relevant today. It was under these circumstances that Paul said to the early believers in Ephesians 6, 10 through 11, he says, finally, my brethren, he's ending his epistle with the armor of God. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Okay, so Paul admonishes believers to put on the whole armor of God, not the parts of the armor, not pieces, but the whole in totality. And that really is, is the key. We need to be putting on every component of the armor of God in totality. In the Greek, it's the panoplia of God, which means the full suit of armor and all of its components, all of its pieces combined are the panoplia or the panoply of, of the armor of God, the whole armor of God. And that's an important distinction. You know, the point being that the various pieces or the panoply of the armor of God work together. Okay, you don't go into battle with only a breastplate and no sword or a sword and no breastplate. You need the helmet, you need the shoes, you need the whole armor of God, including the shield, the sword, and the protective components like the breastplate, the shoes, and the helmet. And so he says to put on not just in part, but the whole armor of God in order to stand against the wiles of the devil. And so the word, uh, the word wiles means the cunning strategy, the deceptive practices employed in manipulating others to do what you want them to do. You know, Satan is a great manipulator. He's a liar. God said he was a liar from the beginning and a murderer from the beginning. But we have to understand that our primary enemy, our primary enemy is Satan himself, not individual human beings. And, and sometimes, including, I'm you know, guilty of this you know, constantly, you get your eyes off who the real enemy is and we start to attack human beings who are lost and as deranged as sometimes they can be and reprobate and just you know, gone off astray. Our real target, you know, our real enemy is Satan himself. And so as tempting as it is to hate and to blame our enemies in the flesh, which I'm guilty of as well, it's certainly become easier today to detest those of the world. They've made it really easy on us to, to do. We have to understand that they are ultimately under the control and influence of Satan himself and the world system which Satan directs and dominates through world governments and power and authority as well as the culture. So remember that Satan is the God and the prince of this world. That's what the Bible calls him, the God with a small g and the prince of this world. So while God ultimately reigns supreme and will rule and reign finally at his second coming, you know, it's until he establishes that millennial reign, he's not fully ruling and reigning on the earth. He's fully ruling and reigning in heaven and he's giving us time before he comes and takes over and, and begins to reign. But, you know, while God ultimately reigns su uh, supreme, Satan, the usurper, 
is now currently in charge of this world and its wicked systems of control. And as Christians are increasingly compromising and giving in and ceding their control and authority to the God-haters in this culture and to the secularists and the humanists and not taking a bold and brave stance for God, Satan's control over the world is quickly compounding. And that's what we're seeing, this, this rise of evil in our culture, this rise of you know, uh, opposition to everything that the Bible promotes from the, from the traditional family to parenting to you know, having the nuclear family, as they call it, and gender roles and all of these things. These are specifically under attack by the devil. There's an agenda at play, and don't take it so lightly. You know? there is a, it's, it's a reason why he's been attacking these particular areas in our culture. It's a concerted and strategic effort by the devil, which means that it's important to God and to his church. And so uh, the apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He's just looking for someone to destroy. And if you're giving him that open door, an open window, by imitating the things of the world, he's going to come after you. He's going to target you, and he's going to, it says, devour you. And so one way to be vigilant against the devil and his wiles and his cunning schemes is to don the armor of God, the whole armor of God, and to apply its principles to our lives. And so the armor of God is a spiritual metaphor for readiness and preparation for that battle. There are practical steps that we can take to apply the armor to our daily walk with Christ, but the battle is both external and internal. In other words, we can't blame Satan for our sin or our transgressions or our errors. Although Satan looks for opportunities to lead us astray and deceive us into forsaking the godly way, we are responsible for our own sins and our own transgressions. So putting on the whole armor of God will aid us with both the internal struggle of the flesh and the external struggle and battle against Satan and the world. And so the Apostle James says in James 4, 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Okay, so we have to, you know, resist. Submit to God. That's the key, is submission to God. Are you submitted to God and to his written word, to the Bible? Do you believe the Bible? Do you apply the Bible's principles to your life? You know, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil. Resist temptation. Resist worldly temptations. And he will flee from you. So donning the whole armor of God is the equivalent of submitting yourself to God through prayer, through vigilance, and the diligent reliance upon the word of God. Paul says in Romans 13, 12, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. There's a cross reference, the armor of light. So the idea is to resist the devil and the culture he controls and manipulates. It really comes down to the culture in many ways for us today. Paul then says in Ephesians 6, 12 through 13, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And so we're all called to do is to simply stand and to withstand. He's not saying to go out and like, you know, start like swinging your sword all over the place, although there's a time and place for that. But really what we're just called to is to stand, stand firm on these biblical principles. Don't waver, don't give in. Stop compromising over the Bible and over the liberties that we also have, in, you know, given to us by God and afforded to us by the U.S. Constitution. You know, I mean, I think of like the COVID lockdowns and how easily people just rolled over and just gave in. I mean, that was the most shocking thing to me to see like red-blooded Americans just be like, okay, let me put on my mask, take my jab and do, you know, it's just, it's, it was a shock to me. Um, and so all we had, all they had to do was stand, you know, just stand on the principles of biblical teaching. Just standing on those principles today is a bold and radical position to take because it flies against everything that this satanically dominated world has to offer us today.
And so our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers of this world who control and manipulate people uh, in order to get you to lose your freedoms. And so uh, the powers and principalities are in actuality, they're different ranks of spirits or demons under Satan's command. That's what the Bible tells us. You know, these are demons and fallen angels, these powers and principalities who are assigned over various governmental authorities and powers throughout the known world. Every nation has them. Every nation, in, in, including the United States, has these powers and principalities. In the USA today, we call them the FBI, the CIA, the Department of Homeland Security, the IRS, the SEC, and the Department of Education. Global principalities include the WEF, the World Economic Forum, the WHO, uh, the World Health Organization, the UN, the EU, and the World Bank. And so don't be deceived. These organizations are not here to protect you, but to protect the agenda of the powerful and elite. They do have an agenda. As you guys, you guys know, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here. As you guys know, they have an agenda right? And it's not to serve you or to help you. We also have examples of powers and principalities in the Bible. In the book of Daniel, Daniel 10, 13, where Daniel refers to the prince of the kingdom of Persia, right? Who withstood him for one and 20 days when, you know, this, this angel was trying to go to Daniel, you know, and deliver God's message. He was actually withstood an angel was withstood. A human power couldn't withstand an angel, but he was withstood by the prince of Persia, who was the principality and the power over the domain and the kingdom of Persia. So the prince of Persia in the Bible was a demon, a powerful fallen angel in charge of the entire kingdom of Persia, and under him were likely various other demons in charge of various provinces and cities and local authorities. And that's what we have in many ways systematically in our in our world governments that's what we see they're behind you know those powers so you know this makes me think in our own time of the local health authorities in our cities i mean if there's ever a totalitarian tyrannical nazi type you know organization in spokane we have the spokane regional health district Right? And they were in charge of shutting down small businesses and ruining lives and destroying dreams as they enforced demonic and tyrannical systems of control. And this is what we're seeing globally now from the WHO and, and the WEF and others, right? It's really demonic. So when, when it blows your mind and you're like, how could this be happening in the USA? It's because there are demonic strongholds and powers that are manipulating every single nation on earth because satan is the god and the prince of this world and as christians step aside and let it happen we see that power of the devil growing in in our culture right so it's the christians it's the spirit it's the word of god that's holding back evil we're the salt and the light right we're preserving this this culture but as we weaken and as we compromise that evil just continues to grow but it really changes your outlook when you consider that even demon-looking septum-nosed ringed and tattooed blue-haired punks, um, who's that thorn in your side, that, you know, that punk in, in the thorn of your side is not the real enemy, but rather the casualty, the ensnared victim of a pervasive satanic deception intricately woven into the very fabric of our society. Now, they've given into it, they're susceptible to it, they have no spirit of God, they have no word, right? And so they're susceptible, and Satan literally owns them, right? He can do with them as, they will, as he wills. They're not under the protection and care of the Holy Spirit, right, and, and the blood of Jesus. And so the world can easily be manipulated into doing what Satan wants. And so it helps you understand that all those spiritually blind reprobates who support the sodomite LGBT agenda are doing so because they have been deceived and given over as reprobates to the devil, is what Romans 1 talks about. And Paul says in Ephesians 6, 14, stand therefore, stand. Again, it's an admonition, just simply stand. You don't have to do a whole lot other than just stand your ground. I mean, that's it, just stand. Right? He says, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Truth matters. 
right? Truth is the key here. And having on the breastplate of righteousness. And so the first two articles of the whole armor of God are introduced. And the first is the belt of truth, having your loins girt about with truth. Truth is the foundation of the Christian life. And we ought to be a people who seek and stand for the truth. Simply stand. We ought to be a people who seek and stand for the truth. This is why we don't participate in the grand delusion of transgenderism. Okay, the worst thing that you can do is to affirm someone's mental illness and delusion. You know, I am never going to call someone by their preferred pronouns. I will go out of my way not to do it. Not just, oh, I'm just going to stay quiet. No, I will purposely go out of my way to make a point of not calling somebody by their preferred pronouns. Okay, because you can send them, you know, you can send me to all the sensitivity and indoctrination that you want, and I'll just continue to be a thorn in the side of the satanic agendas of the world and stand with reality instead of delusion. So it's a lie. The whole thing is a lie. And as a Christian, I won't participate in a lie because I value the truth. And so one of the ways Satan attacks the church is through lies and deception. That's his number one weapon is lies and deception. This is his greatest tool. And if he can get society to follow along with his lies, that's how he wins his battles. And that's how we see incremental progression towards satanic agendas. Now, many things in this world are deception, right? Satan spins a narrative of lies and misinformation in every sector of society, many of which I've already named. And so the belt of truth as a part of the armor of God symbolizes the fundamental importance of truth in the Christian's life. Okay. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. And so the, the gospel is exclusive. There's an exclusivity in the gospel. There's no other way to God but through Jesus Christ. No other way. And so the truth of the gospel is that Jesus is the only way. You only get to God with Jesus. This is a fundamental truth of the universe. You cannot get to God without Jesus. And so truth in this context refers to the truth of God's word, the teachings of Jesus, and living in honesty and integrity throughout your life. Ephesians 4.25 says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So for members of one another, when you lie to someone else, you're lying to yourself, right? You're lying to your own community, your own body, right? So the truth of the gospel brings clarity and direction and is a light in the darkness and a compass in a world of moral relativism, right? We are called to be truth tellers. And so objective truth matters in a world of increasing subjective reality, right? The truth matters. And so they say, but what, what's the big deal? Why can't you just call them by their preferred pronouns? Why does it hurt anyone? Because the truth matters. Okay, it's as simple as that. We are called to be truth tellers. We're, we're saints, for crying out loud. By imputation of Christ, you're called to be saints of God. Saints don't lie, right? You tell the truth and you stand for the truth. It's important. The truth is important, you know, but those who abide in darkness hate the truth, right? The Bible says that Jesus came as the light and they hated that light, right? Second Thessalonians 2.10 says they perished because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved, right? So they're actively working against their own salvation, against the truth. And Jesus said in John 18, 32, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, right? So speaking truth is liberating. You have nothing to hide. Speak the truth. It's out there, right? First John three eighteen says, my little children, let us not love in word nor in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Finally, John 17, 17 says, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. So the belt of truth, that first article in the whole armor of God, is ultimately a reference to the word of God and to scripture. It's the word of God that defines and establishes objective truth and a reality in our culture. And so the first application of the armor of God, the belt of truth, is to study the Bible. You know, how are you going to know what the truth is if you're not reading the Bible, if you're not studying the Bible and making the Bible 
your final authority on all matters of faith, doctrine, and conduct. Okay, so we even ought to rebuke those we love with the truth. You know, there's, you don't hide the truth from those that you love, right? But you do it with a loving and compassionate spirit. You know, I'm not going to receive a word from you on correction if you're coming at me, you know, harshly, right? If you're condemning me, right? But, uh, but I will receive a word spoken in love. Proverbs 9, 8, reprove not a scorner lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man and he will love thee, right? So if you're wise, you'll receive correction is what that's saying. And so I don't mind being corrected if I'm genuinely in the wrong, though that's pretty rare, you know, but... Um, <laughs> But, or yeah, pretty rare. So I don't mind being corrected if I'm genuinely wrong. And here's the key. If I'm approached with respect and kindness and love, right? Uh, Paul also mentions the breastplate of righteousness, the second article in verse 14. The breastplate of righteousness has a twofold application. It encompasses both personal righteousness and the imputed righteousness of Christ. Okay, as believers... We're called to live in a manner consistent with the teachings and the life of Jesus Christ. You know, grace is free. We talk about that all the time. There's nothing that you have to do to earn your own salvation, to maintain it, to keep it. It's a done deal when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you're promised eternal life. Okay, but as believers, you know, we should be doing tons of works. Christianity is actually a very works-based religion. When it comes to the Christian life, when it comes to Christian living, salvation is free, but what happens after that is all is all works based. It's all you're you're rewarded and punished based on what you do. Um, although you can never lose your salvation, you know. There's the judgment seat of Christ that we we've talked about before in First Corinthians three, where the believer is going to be judged for everything that they've done, but not for salvation, for eternal rewards and crowns and and glory and authority. And so this righteousness implies both to justification through faith and sanctification by the Holy Spirit. In other words, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we are called to a level of personal righteousness, ethics, and morality. And we need to make ethical and moral decisions in our daily lives as the Spirit helps us to do so and conforms us to the image of Christ through that sanctification process. And so the breastplate of righteousness symbolizes protection against the assaults of Satan in the realm of making moral decisions and being upright. It's the breastplate. It protects the the chest, the heart, you know, the body. Um, And so just as a physical breastplate protects the heart and the vital organs, the breastplate of righteousness guards the heart and the affections and the emotions of its wearer as we stand up for God in the truth. You know, when we, when we sin, we're opening up, you know, the possibility of Satan manipulating our lives and attacking us and, and living in the flesh, and that can happen, you know. Uh, and so righteous conduct coupled with speaking the truth in love is a defense against Satan's wiles to undermine our moral character as Christians, thereby destroying our testimony for the gospel. Isaiah 59, 17 says, For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and an helmet of salvation upon his head. Don't you love how that's way back there in Isaiah, right? Paul was drawing on metaphors given to us earlier by the prophet Isaiah, even on this, you know, epic, uh, pivotal passage on the whole armor of God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, Paul says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. So we get these cross references. In 2 Corinthians 6, 7, Paul says, By the word of truth, there's the belt of truth again, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. This is throughout scripture. Romans 13, 12, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Paul then says in Ephesians six fifteen, in your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This is now the third article in the whole armor of God. This means that equipped with the truth of God's word, and both personal and imputed righteousness and holiness, 
we are now ready to spread God's word and proclaim the gospel to the lost. Paul says in Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's really that simple. It's just believe the gospel. Believe that Jesus died, took your sins upon himself, went onto the cross, died, was buried, and rose again for you, and just put your faith in him. You know, trust that he did that for you. That's all it takes. Call upon the name of the Lord. Thou shalt be saved. Shall be saved. That's an affirmative. It's a definitive. It's a positive. It's, there's no uh, conditions to that. You will be saved. And so that's all it takes. But then in verses 14 through 15, Paul says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So it's the feet that, you know, go forward into the world and trek the world and traverse the world to spread the gospel. And so we're all called to be preachers. And this isn't just talking about me up here preaching a sermon. It's saying we're all preachers to go out, you know, into the world and fulfill the Great Commission. We're commanded to travel into all the world and preach the gospel to the lost. Now, for many of us, it would take our entire lifetime to simply evangelize our own cities, right? And so that's a great place to start. We need it badly here in the USA, you know, so just like in government, you know, you, we have federal, the federal government, we have localities and local government. It's Start locally, start going, you know, to your neighbors and to people that you know and your friends, to your community and start preaching and sharing a testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Great Commission is given to the church as a whole. And so our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace represents a readiness and preparedness to proclaim the gospel wherever we are called and sent. Right. So Second Timothy 4.2 says, preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Right? So we have to be ready at a given moment, at any time. If someone just comes up to you and says, How do I get saved? You need to be ready to give them an answer. What verses are you going to turn to? Um, and so I'll come back and preach a sermon on that. I do that every year, just on the simple gospel. Have I done that yet this year? Just the gospel? Okay, so we'll come back to that at some time. Not this year. Well, I guess not this year. That's true. It's early. All right. So I'll come back and do that. But, you know, we have to be ready at, a, at an instant to preach. And I remember about seven to eight years back, I was on a live podcast and there was a guest on and I was one of the guests as well. And he was a self-proclaimed expert on the Nephilim issue. And he'd written countless books on it and was the so-called expert. You know, these guys always have all these books that they, that they push and sell, right? And I asked him a simple question, which deeply offended him. My question was simple. In the midst of all this, you know, Nephilim talk and where did they originate and how big, tall they were and all this stuff. And, you know, all this like pre-Adamic race types, all this stuff, garbage that, you know, heresy that was being preached about civilizations even existing before Adam and Eve, you know, is some of the things that they teach. I, I, my question was simple. I said, what is the gospel? How do I get saved? What must I do to be saved? That's all I wanted to know from him. And now if anybody asks me this question, I'm ready to answer it. You know, I can refer to scripture from memory and share the gospel in season and out of season without notice or preparation and on the spot. It's my favorite subject to talk about. It's foremost on my mind wherever I go. When I meet someone who's not a believer, I'm thinking, how can I plant a word? How can I plant a seed to get them saved? That's my objective when I meet people, when I go out in the world. But you know what the so-called Nephilim expert said? He's, he could, you know, he could speak about the size of the giants, the origin of the Nephilim and how they, you know, where they allegedly came from. He's written countless books on the topic. But when confronted, and I didn't, I'm not even going to tell you which side of that I fall on. I think some of you know, it's not even the point today. But when confronted, he couldn't share the simplicity of the gospel with me. And I was subsequently kicked off the show for asking. You know, I wasn't welcome back on that show because I stirred up their, their sacred cow this brilliant author that they had was embarrassed publicly by not, you know, by being asked a simple question. And you know what he said? 
uh, taking clear offense, he said, I wasn't prepared to come on the show and talk about the gospel. I came to speak about the Nephilim, and that's all I was ready for. So in my mind, I'm going, this guy's not even saved. He can't even just say, Jesus saved me, for crying out loud. I mean, just a simple, you know. And so he wasn't even saved, yet he was a self-purported expert on the book of Genesis. And so all of these issues, in my, in my view, all of these issues are a distraction from the gospel. You know, whether you're debating the shape of the earth or the origin of the Nephilim or whether Christmas is pagan or whatever other non-essential topic has consumed your time away from preaching the gospel and teaching the truth of God's word, you've been distracted You've been, you know, it could be a satanic attack on your mind and getting you to be led astray and let off topic into things that are irrelevant to the Great Commission. You know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. He's like, that's all I know. You want to talk to me about the gospel? That's, that's my expertise. That's what I can talk about. And so having our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace involves understanding the gospel, being committed to the truth of God's word, and being ready at all times to defend it and to share it with others. Daniel 12, 3 says, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Okay, so the Bible says that those who preach the gospel right there in Daniel and saved souls will be rewarded with eternal blessings. They will shine as the brightness of the firmament and as the stars forever and ever. Those who turn many to righteousness, that's the imputed righteousness that only comes from Christ. And so that brightness speaks of the differing levels of glory that each believer will receive eternally at the judgment seat of Christ. Again, salvation is a free gift that can't be earned, but God bestows eternal rewards to the faithful based on the works that they have done and the souls that they have saved. You know, when I get to heaven, I'm not on equal plane with Paul the Apostle. You know, I'm not like, well, me and Paul, man, we're just buddies and it's just, you know, we're the same and we have the same level of glory and authority. That's not going to be the case. I'll be the first to admit it. Right? So there's differing levels of authority and power and crowns given that will throw back at Jesus' feet uh, to those who do a work for God as Christians. Paul was again drawing on the words of the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publishes peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. And so the gospel is that third article. Uh, preaching the gospel is what we're supposed to be equipped to do with the whole armor of God. That's why we put on the armor. And then we come to the fourth article in the whole armor of God in Ephesians 6.16. 6, above all, taking the shield of faith, above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You know, in, in ancient battle, those darts were the arrows. And the warriors, with the soldiers, would set those arrows on fire and shoot them out, you know, to the, in the, to the battle, to the, to the other soldiers, right? So it's the fiery darts. It's those arrows that Satan is shooting. And so we need to have the shield of faith to, to block those arrows. And so Paul says, above all, take the shield of faith. Faith is the foundation of it all. It's the chief cornerstone. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so the fiery darts of the devil are doubt, temptation, fear, discouragement that Satan throws at believers. And faith, then, is the shield that not only defends, but extinguishes the fiery darts that are thrown at us by the devil. You know, in, in ancient times, again, they would, these shields, these big long shields would be made out of leather often. Oftentimes they'd be metal and then sometimes overlaid with uh, leather and then they'd soak that leather and make it wet uh, to quench those fiery darts of the enemy. And so this is what Paul is drawing on that metaphor and that symbolism to give us a deeper spiritual insight and meaning. 
And so only the shield of faith can extinguish those fiery darts of the enemy. Psalm 91.4 says, He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. So again, we have the truth. The shield is the truth. It's faith. And it's also a buckler. So in ancient warfare, again, the shield was a defensive piece of armor. You know, you had like a longer, broader uh, shield that was just, you know, covered most of your body. And they kind of form like a line of soldiers in that progression and go forward with the shield. And the buckler, which we often hear in the Bible as well, was a smaller shield, often strapped to the arms as an offensive weapon. And so they kind of hit and block and, and hit with those shields and push the, the enemy back. And so you would block with the shield and strike with the buckler. And so by faith, God is both our defense and our offense against the fiery darts of the enemy. We have an opportunity to push back against the devil and against what he's doing in our cultures and our society and nations. It's not game over yet. I mean, we can always fight back, but it's just not enough people are standing. Not enough people care. Not enough people are, you know, they're not, they're just consumed with their own lives, their own entertainment with whatever it is. And they don't want to they don't want to stir up trouble it stirs up trouble i've been known to stir up trouble in my day quite a few times you know kind of upsets my kids sometimes it embarrasses them sometimes but I, you know but you got to stand you got to make you got to take a stand for truth and for the the truth of god's word proverbs 30 verse 5 says every word of god is pure he is a shield unto them that put their trust in him Psalm 28, 7 says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusteth in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song will I praise him. So, you know, it's the, it's the shield of faith. We have to have faith in Jesus Christ as the foundation and the cornerstone. And if you're lacking in faith as a believer, ask God. Remember that, that soldier that, or that man that said, God, help thou mine unbelief? right, when he was lacking in faith, we can ask God to give us a greater measure of faith for our lives. The last two components in the armor of God are described in Ephesians 6, 17. It says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so the fifth article, the fifth piece in the armor of God is the helmet of salvation. So faith brings about salvation. It's a natural progression there. And again, these are basic elementary and foundational fundamental truths as symbolized and depicted by the armor of God. And so the helmet protects the head or the mind in battle. But it's the helmet of salvation. And so there's two components to this. Number one, the truth of God's word protects our mind. Okay, it protects our mind from the fiery darts of the enemy, but mainly the helmet of salvation, because the head you know, is protecting the mind, but number two, mainly the helmet of salvation can be interpreted as the hope of eternal life and as a metaphor for the assurance of salvation. You know, one area that Satan wants to attack is your assurance of salvation. He wants to bring in works into your theology and get you to doubt whether you've done enough whether you're doing enough, whether you're faithful enough, whether you believe enough. And if you don't, he's going to put doubt in your mind and teach you doctrinally that you can lose your salvation, that God could take it away. But that's not the, that would be works. If you could lose eternal life, first of all, it wouldn't be eternal anymore because eternal by definition means it goes on forever. And Jesus promised us eternal life, right? So, um, it's, it's important, it's a very, it's one of the most important doctrines for believers that Satan likes to attack. And so it's a, it's a metaphor for the assurance of salvation. Matthew Henry, commentator, said, salvation must be our helmet. That is hope, which has salvation for its object. The helmet secures the head, a good hope of salvation, well-founded and well-built, will both purify the soul and keep it from being defiled by Satan. Elsewhere, he said, we must stand armed, and this is here most enlarged upon. Here is a Christian in complete armor. The armor is divine, the armor of God, the armor of light, armor of righteousness. The apostle specifies the particulars of this armor, both offensive and defensive. The military girdle or belt, the breastplate, the greaves or soldier's shoes, 
the shield, the helmet, and the sword. And then he says this, this is the part of why I'm giving you this quote. It says, it is observable that among them all, there is none for the back. If we turn our back upon the enemy, we lie exposed. I think that's kind of an interesting concept. So the, the, it's that the armor of God, when fully donned, will help us to face and to confront the attacks of the enemy. You have to face them, you know, face on, head on, full force, right? Uh, you stand firm. You don't turn back. You, you look, at, look, at, look at them straight on and fight those battles. And so one of the areas that Satan seeks to attack is our assurance of salvation. The Bible says that we are eternally saved. We are eternally secured. That's the helmet of salvation. Protect your mind against <laughs> Satan's attacks uh, for, of your eternal life. When Jesus saved me, he promised me eternal life. Jesus didn't say, believe in me and you might be saved if you continue in the faith and do X, Y, or Z. You know, or if you don't do X, Y, or Z to keep your salvation. No, he promised me eternal life. It was as simple as that. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not might be saved, but shall be saved. John 3, 16, the, you know, simple. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, right? So believe in him, believe in the only begotten son, you'll have everlasting life. Goes on forever. You have everlasting life now in the spirit awaiting the regeneration of the body. The Bible says that we are seated in heavenly places with Christ right now. You know how that works? Other than time is involved eternal you know the eternal uh, realm is involved right so earlier in ephesians 2 6 through 8 it says and hath raised us up together that's that's in the you know current tense we've already been raised up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in christ jesus that he ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith and not, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. You know, Jesus also said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Is Jesus a liar? Right? I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's the promise of eternal life. It's unconditional once you believe and put your faith in Jesus as your one and only God and Savior. But, you know, people will say, oh, well, you know, he won't leave you, but you can leave him. You know, have you, I don't know if you've heard that before. He won't leave you, but you can walk away. But that's not possible either after you've been born again. You can't be unborn. You're not going to be unregenerated and then mess up and then, you know, then, then repent again and then be regenerated again and be born again again and then, you know, back and forth. It doesn't work like that. You're born again one time, and you're eternally sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit, which now dwells inside of you. You know, and the Bible says that we're a purchased possession. We actually belong to Jesus. We've been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. We belong to him. He bought us with his blood. We are not our own, right? So finally, Paul talks about the sixth and last item in the armor of God in Ephesians 6, 17, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And there's a lot of material today, six, do six sermons on each six of these, uh, but we're, get, we're at the last one here, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We now come to the final and most important of all the pieces of armor, which is not actually armor, but a sword, which completes the panoplia of the armor of God. And so the sword of the spirit is the word of God. It's the only true offensive weapon in the whole armor of God, you know, besides maybe the buckler. But when Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness, he always rebuked Satan with scripture. He always referred back to the word of God. He used it as a, as a, as a weapon. And so Matthew 4, 3 through 4, when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So it's that picture of the sword, right? That sword coming out of the mouth of Jesus is his word, is the word of God. Jesus uses the word of God as a weapon against Satan in the wilderness. And so the life application here is that we ought to do the same. You know, hide the word in your heart. 
memorize scripture, live and breathe scripture, read the word daily and all the time, have it inside of you. Let it be a part of you and let it answer your adversary in the way. You know, let God's word guide you into all truth against the wiles of the devil. You know, just consume it. The way we're on our phones all the time and checking like the stock market or your social media or whatever it is and what's happening on YouTube and Facebook or, you know, what's the uh, discord for the younger kids or whatever, you know. Instead of like spending your time on, on that and being consumed by all of these, you know, extra curricular activities, spend time in the word of God. Be consumed by it. Devour the word of God. Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And so the Bible is pictured as, you know, in the Bible itself as a sword. Because the word is sharp and it's effective against the wiles of the devil and the sins of the flesh. Hebrews 4, 12, For the word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You know, as I mentioned, Jesus is pictured with a sword in his mouth at a second coming. Because Jesus returns, this shows us that Jesus is returning to make war and defeat Satan and the unbelieving and the wicked at his return. When Jesus returns, he's not coming back in peace, he's coming back in war. You know, the first time he rode in on a donkey, on an ass, you know, humble and lowly, and offering peace and salvation and praises to God and inviting people into the kingdom. The next time he will return riding on a horse because that's what they did. It was battle horses and declaring war. So when he returns, he's no longer lowly and humble on a donkey. He's coming back on a war horse to conquer and to defeat his enemies. Revelation 19:15 says, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. That means there won't be any more pride parades or abortions. Those days will be over. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. The law will be different when Jesus returns during the millennial reign of Christ. There will still be unbelieving nations who are doing pagan things. But he's going to rule them and not allow them to do that. He's going to rule them with a rod of iron. It's going to be illegal to be gay. It's going to be illegal to murder your own child. You know, that might bother your modern sensibility, but it's, it's how it's going to be. We're going to return to the law of God, to the moral law of God, uh, during the millennial reign of Christ. And so Jesus will come back declaring war. And Jeremiah 23, 29 says, Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? So the word of God is a weapon against evil. And when Jesus returns, he will defeat the Antichrist with the sword of his mouth. He won't even have to fight. He won't have to, you know, do any physical battle in any way or lift a finger. It's his word alone that's enough to vanquish the Antichrist and by extension Satan forever. Second Thessalonians 2.8 says, Then shall that wicked be revealed, that's a reference to Antichrist, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. He first destroys the Antichrist at his return. We get the millennial reign when Satan will be bound for a thousand years, then re-released for the final, you know, Armageddon final battle. And then, you know, Satan will be vanquished at the very end and thrown into the lake of fire with the false prophet and the Antichrist. And so that's the sword of the spirit. That's the word of God. It's a, it's a sharp tool that we have. This is why we use the King James Version of the Bible. You don't want a butter knife. You want a sword. You know, you want the true word of God. You want a word that's accurate, not 80% accurate, not 90%, not even 99% accurate. I want, the, I want scripture that I can rely on and be like every single jot and tittle. Every word of God is pure. Every, you know, every part of it I can trust and rely on is the, is the written word of God. And uh, so let's end, and we've covered a lot. Let's end today's sermon with Isaiah 54, 17. And I admonish you, you know, and I'll pray for you to put on the whole armor of God 
so that you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil and the temptations of the flesh. Pray for me as well. You know, I'm not exempt in any way. I need to be putting on the same armor of God that I'm instructing all of you and Paul's instructing all of you to put on. And Isaiah 54, 17 says, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and the righteousness is of me, saith the Lord.